In recent months, the Pakistani Taliban has staged a series of high-profile attacks. This has raised fears that the group may be re-emerging as one of the most significant challenges to the country's peace and security. However, it's also led to important questions about the relationship between Pakistan and the Taliban regime in neighbouring Afghanistan. So, what exactly lies behind the growing violence and why could it potentially lead to a far more significant conflict between the two countries? Hello and welcome. If you're new to the channel, my name is James Kerlinzi and here I take an informed look at international relations, conflict, security and statehood. Over the past half century, Afghanistan has been a central issue in international relations. Having been invaded by the Soviet Union in 1979 and then by the United States in 2001, it's frequently been at the forefront of the news. But while analysts and observers have long poured over the geopolitical aspects of the issue, there's one important element that's often seemed oddly confusing and contradictory to outside observers. The role of neighbouring Pakistan. Although many credit Pakistan with having created the Taliban, which is now back in power in Afghanistan, the wider relationship between Pakistan and Afghanistan is both fascinating and complex. Pakistan and Afghanistan lie in South Asia. At around 880,000 square kilometres or 340,000 square miles, Pakistan is the 33rd largest member of the United Nations. Meanwhile, lying to its northwest is Afghanistan. At 650,000 square kilometres or 250,000 square miles, it's the 40th largest UN member. Although relatively similar in size, their populations differ enormously. In contrast to Afghanistan, which has around 40 million inhabitants, it's believed that Pakistan's population currently stands at around 230 million, ranking fifth in the world. While both countries are predominantly Sunni Muslim, ethnically they're extremely diverse. However, for our purposes, the key group to focus on are the Pashtuns. Speaking a language related to Iranian and spread across South Afghanistan and the West and Northwest Pakistan, they number around 50 million people. Representing around half of Afghanistan's inhabitants, they make up 15% of Pakistan's population making them the second largest group after the Punjabis. Pakistan and Afghanistan have a long and extraordinary history. However, our story really begins in the 19th century, having consolidated its position across the Indian subcontinent, including present-day Pakistan, Britain began pushing northwards into Afghanistan, a growing target for Russian imperial expansion. Despite failing to take the country, in 1855, Britain and the Emirate of Afghanistan established friendly relations. But as Russian influence continued to grow, Britain launched another invasion in 1878. While this too was beaten back, a new agreement saw Afghanistan now become a British protectorate. And in 1893, they formally defined their border along the so-called Durand Line, a boundary that now divided traditional Pashtun lands. Having terminated the protectorate in 1919, Afghanistan became a fully independent kingdom in the 1920s before becoming a member of the United Nations in 1946. Meanwhile, in 1947, British rule over India came to an end and the country was partitioned. While the mainly Hindu areas now became the Republic of India, the Muslim areas in the north formed the new Dominion of Pakistan, which then became the Islamic Republic of Pakistan in 1956. From the start, relations between Afghanistan and Pakistan were strained, as Afghanistan questioned the borders of the new Pakistani state. Arguing that the Durand Line was never meant to be an official boundary, it called for the Pashtun areas to be handed over to its control. This would lead to significant tensions. Aside from being the only country to vote against Pakistan's membership of the United Nations, Afghanistan now began to support Pashtun separatist movements. This would in turn see the two countries sever diplomatic relations for several years in the early 1960s. These problems continued even after the Afghan king was deposed and the country became a republic in 1973. In December 1979, 
everything changed. After a coup by Marxist military officers faced growing opposition, the Soviet Union invaded Afghanistan. This would completely transform the relationship. As a close Western ally, Pakistan now became a vital route for US and international assistance to the Mujahideen, the armed Islamic movement leading the fight against Soviet occupation. And this would continue even after the USSR finally withdrew from Afghanistan in 1988. Rather than usher in a period of stability, the country descended into civil war as the various Mujahideen groups turned on each other. This provided an opening for a new group to emerge. Drawing on ethnic Pashtuns educated in Pakistan's religious schools, the Taliban, or students, soon came to the attention of Pakistan's powerful military and intelligence establishment. Seeing an opportunity to gain control over Pakistan's historically troublesome northern neighbour, they now began to support the new group of fighters. As a result, the Taliban rapidly grew in strength. Having first emerged in 1994, by September 1996, it had seized the Afghan capital, Kabul. Once in power, the Taliban introduced an extreme form of Islamic rule. As well as strictly applying Sharia law, it severely curtailed human and women's rights and destroyed much of the country's rich cultural heritage. At the same time, the Taliban also made Afghanistan a haven for other militant Islamist groups that were waging war against the West. This all came to a head on the 11th of September 2001 when one of the groups, Al-Qaeda, attacked the United States. Just weeks later, the US and its NATO partners invaded Afghanistan and by the end of the year, the Taliban had been forced from power. But rather than disappear, the group remained an active force in the country, launching an armed insurgency against US and NATO forces operating in Afghanistan. Although Pakistan had been one of just three countries that had recognised the Taliban regime alongside Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates, 9-11 made continued support for the regime impossible. But while Islamabad publicly disavowed the Taliban and joined the so-called War on Terror, it nevertheless retained close ties with its former allies, providing sanctuary for many of the leadership and fighters. However, in the years that followed, it came under increasing pressure to be seen to act against the Taliban and Al-Qaeda. In 2004, it therefore launched a massive military operation in the Pashtun-dominated border with Afghanistan, an area then known as the federally administered tribal areas. Having been all but off limits to the Pakistani government for decades, the incursion, which involved around 70,000 troops, led to widespread anger amongst local leaders and the thousands of Pashtuns who'd fought for the Taliban in neighbouring Afghanistan. In 2007, following a particularly controversial military raid, a new group emerged, Terek e Taliban Pakistan, otherwise known as the TTP or the Pakistani Taliban, and drawing on various militant groups, it launched an uprising with the aim of ending Pakistan's efforts to control the Pashtun tribal areas. From the start, there were questions about the exact relationship between the TTP and the Afghan Taliban. On the one hand, they clearly shared close personal and ethnic ties, as well as the same broad ideology. Moreover, TTP fighters were taking part in attacks against NATO forces in Afghanistan. However, at the same time, the two groups clearly had very different agendas. While the TTP wanted to oust Pakistan from the tribal areas, the Afghan Taliban was focused on forcing NATO from Afghanistan. To this end, the Afghanistan Taliban needed to maintain its good relations with Pakistan and the elements within the security services that were providing it with valuable support. Despite this, in the years that followed, the conflict between Pakistan and the TTP escalated. This came to a head in 2014, when following a major crackdown on the TTP, the group attacked an army-run school, killing over 130 children. An act that sparked international revulsion and condemnation. In the aftermath of the attacks, the TTP threat appeared to decline. Weakened by the Pakistan army's ongoing operations, which forced it to relocate to eastern Pakistan and Afghanistan, it was also hit by defections to other Islamist insurgent groups, including the Afghan Taliban's arch-rival, the Islamic State of Khorasan province. 
Meanwhile, as the United States appeared to be drawing down its presence in Afghanistan, the relationship between Pakistan and the Afghan Taliban gained ground, much to the anger of Pakistan's Western partners. This was graphically illustrated in January 2018 when President Trump publicly accused Pakistan of deceit for sheltering terrorists. Just days later, the US announced that it was withholding at least $900 million of security assistance. However, Pakistan's bet on the Afghan Taliban appeared to pay off in February 2020 when the Trump administration signed a landmark peace deal with the Taliban. In return for withdrawing US troops, the group pledged that the country wouldn't again become a base for armed anti-Western groups. Just over a year later, in August 2021, the last remaining US and NATO forces staged a hasty retreat as the Taliban swept back into the country's capital, Kabul. While the Taliban's return to power was greeted with horror around the world, Pakistan saw it as a victory. Although Pakistan joined the rest of the world and refused to recognise the Taliban as Afghanistan's new government, the Pakistani Prime Minister nevertheless made it clear that his country intended to be a link between the Taliban and the wider world. But Pakistani hopes that it would now become the new power broker in Kabul were premature. Moreover, the Taliban's victory in Afghanistan heralded a revival of the TTP, which stepped up its attacks as the Taliban swept to victory. Despite Islamabad's hopes that the Taliban would now reign in the TTP, it showed little willingness to do so. Instead, Kabul organised talks between the sides. And although this led to a ceasefire, this eventually broke down in November 2022, thus sparking the latest wave of serious attacks. But what makes things even more significant is that the border issue now seems to be emerging once again. This was highlighted in early 2022 when a dispute arose over a new fence. Responding to the incident, the Afghan Information Minister explicitly raised the unresolved status of the Durand Line and the way it had divided the Pashtun nation. On top of this, there have also been other interesting signs that things seem to have changed in the Pakistan-Taliban relationship. Aside from the fact that the Taliban regime in Kabul seems to have little want or need for Pakistan's role as an intermediary on the world stage, it appears to be going out of its way to push back against Islamabad. For example, it's been engaging with India, Pakistan's arch enemy, a relationship that New Delhi seems open to developing. All this suggests that having regained control in Afghanistan, the Taliban, or at least important elements of it, seem happy to push back against Pakistan's efforts to control it. To this end, its apparent refusal to crack down on the TTP, coupled with its references to the contested border and a divided Pashtun nation, will no doubt be read with concern in Pakistan, having created or at least nurtured the Afghan Taliban for its own ends to try to control Afghanistan, Pakistan may now face the very real possibility that the tide is turning. And if the Afghan Taliban is now embracing its Pakistani offshoot, as well as building relations with India, this would of course mark a dramatic reversal of fortunes in relations between Pakistan and the Taliban. Before I go, I'd like to say a huge thanks to the sponsor of today's video, the truly excellent World Politics Review. Do make sure to take a look at their great introductory offer for channel viewers. In the meantime, here's another video from me. Thanks so much for watching and see you in the next one.